when things start to be really hard for me, like, and I don't quite understand why it's like all these little things happen. I'm like, why are these things so hard for me right now? And there's something in my life that I'm not paying attention to. I'm not being true to like, whether it's a relationship that I'm in, that isn't true to me, or I'm not being authentic to myself, or it's something that I'm doing in work that I'm forcing something. And so I have noticed it's a little bit woo woo. When I am really true to my gut, I know I'm on the right path when I see things line up in a way that's serendipitous. You were actually guest number three on my podcast. And uh, when we first did it, it was called At the End of the Tunnel. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about how you came up with, you and your, and your, your peers came up with the bucket list concept. And so it was really wonderful. I actually re-listened to that episode in preparation for this conversation. And I just forgot how amazing it is, man, and inspiring. And, and um, so now you're back. It's, it's the Light Watkins Show. And you have this, uh, this new offering to the world called the Bucket List Journal. And you gave me a copy of it when we saw each other the last time in Los Angeles a few couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was love at first sight. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I immediately invited you back onto the podcast. I think you're probably the second or third returning guest that I've had. And so I'm excited to dive into the, uh, the backstory of the, of the journal and also some other uh, subjects that I wanted to talk about, such as uh, the concept of death and because your whole thing is what are you going to do before you die and taking big leaps of faith and purpose. I really want to talk about purpose as well. But anyway, welcome back Mm -hmm. to the show. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. It's good to be back here. Good to see your face. And it's good to hang out in in LA. Miss you uh, out here, but happy to see you thriving, jumping all over the world and and just doing what you do. So thank you. Thanks, man. So um, listeners, if you guys, if you guys check out the first episode with Ben, you'll hear the whole backstory and where we leave off that conversation. We're talking a little bit about your public speaking career and uh, and kind of how it started with those ESL uh, students. You and Duncan, <laughs> I think, were going around to to universities and giving those keynotes to people who barely barely spoke um, English. <laughs> English, or they were learning yeah. how to speak English, right? Which is and, a great um, a great place to start because uh, <laughs> you have more uh, uh, you have you have a more receptive audience and if they can't understand what you're saying totally then that's that's okay <laughs> you get you get you get more uh, more leeway with those types of engagements so that was yeah that was the very beginning that was back in Victoria British Columbia right after the first road trip that we did where we really thought this was just going to be a two week road trip and then that was going to be it and but it just organically continued to, to grow from there. Well, the other aspect to your story, and it's funny because if you see enough movies, you'll, st- you'll start, and you're paying really close attention. Well, I've also studied screenwriting before. I'm not a screenwriter. I just was curious about the art form. But you start to see the same patterns, act one, act two, act three. And somewhere between, actually what, what, what delineates act two and act three is it looks like the hero of the story has found their calling, has found their purpose, but then something happens and they end up in like the worst position ever. And it looks like the whole thing is pretty much done, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then the whole third act is about how they get this, this miraculous chance to go and, and, um, and fulfill that purpose. And, and, mm-hmm. and they have to kind of take a leap of faith in that direction. And that essentially is what has been happening in almost all of the people that I've interviewed in this mm-hmm. podcast, because it's all about people who started movements, who found their calling, who've taken leaps of faith. And you guys had something similar too, after your first two tours, and you put all your money into that, that documentary, and mm-hmm. um, you turn down this potentially lucrative television show, Mm-hmm. And then cut to you're moving back into your home with your parents, right? <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about, about that experience and how you kind of got back into the, the semi-depressed state, but you saw it coming this time and you were able to kind of uh, employ some of the tools and resources mm-hmm. that you learned along the way that you may not have even realized they were going to come in handy at that time. And then 
now, you know, it's gotten, you, you're like a world, you're, you're like, what is the second most famous motivational speaker in the world or something like that? But definitely not the most second most famous, but I did, uh, but I did, but I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, definitely not close to that, but I, there, there was, uh, I did get on a list of top motivational speakers, which was very cool to see, to be on a same, uh, any list with Tony Robbins and Simon Sinek. So that was a very cool, cool moment. But I think dating back to the beginning and for those that, that don't know the story it, it, very quickly, Friends and, and, and um, three friends and I in college set on a road trip to make a film about a bucket list and helping other people achieve their bucket list items. And it started to get its own momentum and people wanted to help. And then other people wanted help with their dreams. So we just kept doing it and it grew. And then we got offered a television show, but we wanted to maintain creative control and we weren't going to be in control of the creative for the show. So we turned it down and we kept raising money and filming. And then we ran out of money. And then uh, we realized we didn't have enough money to finish our documentary that we had started. And then we realized that we had blown a big opportunity by turning down a television show. And I had dropped out of school and I started to get quite, quite down and, and depressed. And I, uh, as you said, moved back into my parents' house. I started working in a bar. I didn't even know how to bartend. <laughs> I, I was just kind of figuring out, trying to put the pieces back together. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and the part of the story that, that I also just mentioned is this all began out of quite a dark place. Uh, I go into it in, in, in our previous conversation, but, uh, back before this whole road trip began, I got really depressed in my first year at university and I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed. And it just kind of built up and built up. And I hit my first mental health crisis in my first year. I had a scholarship. I was on a national the under 19 national rugby team. And so that was probably the scariest time of my life. I had never experienced anything like this, but I came out of that. Um, and as you said, I learned things about myself. And so the next time it happened, I was a little bit more aware of what I needed to be healthy. I had a bit of a support network. I had a, a counselor that I'd been talking to at school. It wasn't, I wasn't so ashamed about talking about it in general to my friends. Cause I'd finally opened up to my friends and realized that I wasn't the only one that had been experiencing some of these things. So I was a little bit freed up to talk about it and I had support around me. And I also had learned some things about myself. I knew that if I started losing sleep, I, I better pay attention. You know, something wasn't right and I needed to slow down or I needed to take time for myself. I needed to look at what was going on. And so I did have that awareness and I think that helped through that second dip. And if I look over the past you know, 15, 20 years, I still go through dips, but each time I think it's a little less intense just because as you said, like you start to learn a little bit more about yourself and you build your toolbox of habits and things that you know are good for you. And so I, uh, so at that point uh, I, we were really down because we had given up this big opportunity uh, for, to do a show. And, um, but luckily, you know, I leaned on the three other guys and we were able to kind of pick one another up when the other person felt down and we, we kept taking small steps forward. And I ended up meeting someone that knew some people in LA and on a whim, I flew down to LA and started meeting people and ultimately put together a pilot and pitched the show. And that got us back on our feet because we ended up selling the show. Um, but it's, it was definitely a long, a long journey. And I think that, uh, you know, one, the understanding that you're going to go through some more, downs in your life is important because you just know that that's inevitable. That's part of the human experience. And two, the understanding that each time you do go through something, you're sort of, you're sort of building up your resilience in a way, you know, like you're, you, you go through battle and you come out with some scars, but you've like, you know, what works. And so that's how I feel about it. And um, you also see the signs earlier. And I think that awareness is also really important because as you get older, you just, you just start to learn more about yourself. And I guess that's like, that's, that's the big, the big goal is to learn about yourself so you can be more true to yourself so that you can live more intentionally and be that version of yourself. That's more authentic because I feel like that's where you make your most impact. And in a funny way, that's what this whole project has been about is about coming back to who you truly are. And I didn't realize this when we started this, but in the beginning I got depressed because I think I wasn't living the life I wanted. I was living the life 
I thought others expected of me or, or what I thought others wanted for me. And so my bucket list was a roadmap. Uh, it was a, it was a reminder of those things that were really important to me. And now years later, I realized that that's just a really great device to keep you on track and live true to yourself in a world that feels like it just constantly pulls you away from who you really are. And uh, so for me, the bucket list has been that tool that brings me back to, and as a reminder and, and reminds me of those things that are really important to me, not other people. What are some of the telltale signs that you're living true to yourself? I, this is really interesting because this is what I've felt lately. I feel like when you're living true to yourself, your life ha- rolls out in front of you with ease. And I feel like there's a natural momentum to your life. Things are clicking. I find that when I'm living true to myself, life starts to happen for me. It's like I'm going downstream and I see little opportunities and I jump on those little opportunities and they lead to more opportunities. It feels like I'm in flow. I guess that's another way of describing it. And when things start to be really hard for me, like, and I don't quite understand why, you know, some, it's like all these little things happen. I'm like, why are these things so hard for me right now? You know? And there's something in my life that I'm not paying attention to. I'm not being true to like, whether it's a relationship that I'm, that I'm in, that isn't true to me, or, or, or I'm not being authentic to myself, or it's something that I'm doing in work that I'm forcing something. And so I have noticed it's a little bit, Woo woo, but I have noticed that, you know, when I am really true to my gut, I know I'm on the right path when I see things line up in a way that's serendipitous. Mm-hmm. And um, what are some of the signs of not being true? Because you've had that experience as well, where you weren't true to yourself. So how, how did you? Is it possible to know that in the moment? And if so, how? I think if you have the uh, awareness, so, so here's the signs that I noticed that are um, telltale signs for me for not living true to myself. Um, I feel as though I'm not hitting my true potential. I'm not able to be the full expression of myself. I start to have trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I'm in a fog. Things are, things feel hard and uh, I'm not being who I want to be for other people, for friends. You know, I'm not being the friend I want to be that I know I should be. I'm not being the partner. I know that I should be to my partner. And like, I don't have the capacity to do that. And when I, when I feel like I am living true myself, I feel like I, have the capacity to be that person that I know I, I am, that I want to be, that, you know, true, I truly am. And it all comes, comes easily. So it's a really interesting question. And it's something that I've noticed in the past that, you know, I, I, I struggle with, with, I'm the type of person that struggles with depression. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I've also noticed that part of my struggles comes from when I'm doing something in my, in my life that, that, I mean, this sounds simple, but that makes me unhappy. So if I'm, if I'm working on something or there's a, there's a, a part, there's a relationship that is not the right relationship. And so now I've realized that when I start to lose sleep, which is the first sign for me, because that's when my mind keeps going and I have this anxiety that comes out at night and that keeps my mind going. So I can't sleep. So when I start to lose sleep, I, I, I need to look at, okay, what, what part of my life is, is not aligned. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that's my first indicator. Yeah. Because, you know, like we said earlier, you're, you're now known as one of the most gifted, talented, motivational speakers. But before that, I think you had a production company or something like that. Like when I first met you, you had some yeah. production company in Venice and now you're like full-time motivational speaking, but I would imagine that if we had this conversation back then, you would have said being in a, having that production company was 
part of your dream or purpose. I don't know. Was that the case or how did you know it was time to transition out of that and, and go all in on, on, on keynote speaking? I started to get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was, I was feeling, you know, I realized that the production was not what I thought it was going to be. I love the creative process. I didn't like the business of the production. I didn't love the, the people I was interacting with all the time. And uh, it was draining me. And so it turned out to be something that I didn't love. And as a result, I started just to get totally flattened by it. And to the point where we were starting to succeed in, because we were just grinding. But I, uh, and, and we, we got some investment. And, and then I, I told my partner, I said, guys, I'm not the guy to run this. I'm just, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I just know I, I just knew I couldn't do that. And I, at the time, serendipitously, I'd done a TEDx talk and someone had seen it and contacted their speaker agent. And the speaker agent reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to come speak at this event. And I said, sure, because I was in transition. And then it that blossomed into what I'm doing now. And then I started to see this momentum. Then I started to see this ease. You know, everything started clicking. And I realized that I needed, it didn't need to be as hard as I thought. I didn't need to have a perfect plan. I just needed to follow the momentum and follow the energy. And so when I leaned into that, that's when things started to unravel. And I realized that I had made such a important choice. And it, it's, it's, I, it's interesting that I, you asked me what, what I'm doing next week. And I told you I'm going back to Canada to um, celebrate the life of my uncle who passed away during COVID. And in this transition, I called this uncle and he was a producer for his whole career. And he was 70 years old at the time. And he had just graduated, sorry, he had just retired. And, and, and in his retiring age, he had decided that his next stage of life, he was going to be a stand-up comedian at 70. Mm. <laughs> because it's something he'd always wanted to do. And he wished he had done it earlier, but this is. And so I talked to him. I said, listen, I'm torn up about this. I've spent the last three years building this production company. It's finally, quote unquote, working. We've got the investment um, and I don't know if I, I, I can't do it anymore and I don't want to start again. And he said, well, you're not starting again. You're recycling your career. You're taking everything that you've learned so far as a producer and you're going to pivot and do your next thing. You're not starting from the bottom. You're just pivoting. Mm -hmm. And that idea of recycling my career and using the skills I've learned versus starting at the first rung of the ladder again was empowering enough to make me feel a little more comfortable with making that pivot. And he said, look, everyone should recycle their career whenever they want, because as you grow, you change and your career ambitions might change. Some people continue to stay fired up about what they do their entire career. And they, they can continue to stay inspired by it and, and pivot in, in that lane and continue to be more and more excited. And, and some people need to try new things. And that's, completely normal. Uh, so that was a, a meaningful conversation for me with him and, and, and around that idea of pivoting to following your true calling. And it's interesting, like the more I think, think about this, the more I speak about it and talk about it, 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 it becomes really quite simple. And this whole project was inspired by a poem which you know, is called The Buried Life. And The Buried Life poem, written by an uh, old English poet named Matthew Arnold, who my friend Johnny read this poem in English class back in 2006, and it was, it's what inspired this whole project. But the poem basically talked about the day-to-day -day burying what you really want to do. And you have these moments when you're inspired, but life gets in the way, life buries them. And that there's this line in the poem that says, something along the lines of tracking our true original course. And I've always loved that idea of, you know, what, we're just trying to track our true original course. And so for me, that true original course is, 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 is a life where you feel fulfilled and, and each step of the way, it starts to feel more and more rich and, and in almost easier as you go that means you're following this 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 path so anyways it's funny the poem was written 150 years ago and 
we're still feeling these these same feelings today. Mm. So there's a conversation happening online um, about what it means to be a high value man. Mm -hmm. Also, I want about what it means to be a high value woman, but I want to focus on, on masculinity right now because a part of that is the people who are advocates of, you know, this high value man archetype. They say that the most important thing is to be financially abundant. It doesn't matter really what you do. It doesn't matter if you're passionate about it. You know, as long as you're grinding, kind of like what you were describing earlier, you'll eventually break through and you'll hit this financially abundant um, space where, you know, you, that affords you a level of freedom in all areas, relationship wise, uh, lifestyle wise, that you can then give and do things that excite you and whatnot. So when you talk about purpose, how does it sort of align with that? Or are those people sort of not seeing the full picture or is it kind of, um, is it, is it more of a subjective thing? Like how, how do you, how do you, how would you contribute to that conversation? Well, I think that you don't necessarily have to make money from your purpose. Your job mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily need to be the thing that fulfills you. I think that it's really great if it does, but I, 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 there is a fine line there where you, you start to go down this path of, of, of doing your purpose as your job and then it becomes your business and it becomes less fulfilling because it turns from something that you love into something that you know needs to make money. And that's a very delicate line to walk, you know? If you're, if you're passionate as photographer, photography and all of a sudden you're a professional photographer, well, it becomes very different when you're earning your living um, taking photos than it, than it does when you go out and you just shoot for fun. And I think that that's something that we don't always think about that is a pitfall of making money from your purpose, you know, doing what you love as your, as your job. I think you, it's important to love what you do, but it doesn't necessarily have to be your purpose and mission. What, what I do think is that it's important to identify the things that are going to bring you that sense of purpose and make sure that you carve out time for those things because they tend to be the first things that get pushed to the back burner and they tend to be the first things that you, uh, and, and also the, the biggest things you end up regretting at the end of your life if you don't do them. So mm -hmm. that could be something as simple as spending time with your nephew or it could be something as big as climbing Everest, but those, those personal passions that, that give you that sense of purpose are the, the first things to fall through the cracks because there's no deadlines and because there's no accountability. And we think we have all this time to do these things, but we don't. So, you know, to get back to your question about, is it the person that just grinds and grinds and, makes the money and then can provide or give back or, I mean, that's sort of a difficult answer, a uh, question to answer, because I think it depends on sort of what your, what's important to you and what holistically you, you want in your life. Perhaps the biggest thing in your life is to provide for your family because you love your family the most. And that's what you feel called to do and you need to do. And so then I think that would probably make sense for other people. I think that it's probably important to identify other things that are going to fill them up and, and make sure that you uh, protect time to do those things. And because what I found is, is that is the, that is the hardest part. And I, I, I think that there's, there's many things we can do to make sure that those don't fall through the cracks. But I think, you know, when you think about the top five regrets of the dying, uh, they're not necessarily tied to making money. In fact, mm -hmm. One of them is I wish I would have worked less. So, you know, you look at the level of and uh, the amount of happiness you get from money. I'm going to botch this, this, the, this data, but I think it's around 70 or $75,000 or there's, there's a number where yeah. up to that number, you, you are happier, but you double that and you get, you, your returns become much less. You get a, a percentage, you get a, 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 a a small percentage increase in happiness every time you double that number. 
So obviously you need to meet the needs of, of, of your basic, you know, basic needs. But when you think about this, this tendency that is ingrained in us as humans, which is like, you, 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 you set a goal for a number that you want to make and you hit that goal and you're not, you're not celebrating. You're already thinking about how you can make more. You're already thinking about how can I double that? It's just this, this, I, this feeling that we have that we need to continually make more and more when we you sort of look at what re- really makes you happy. And it's, it's not going to make you uh, a large amount uh, ex- exponentially happier. So that's the, that's the two things that I think about is like, how much more happy am I going to get by making more money? Mm-hmm. And how much happier am, am I going to get when I um, pursue these things that I, that are important to me that are um, generally pushed to the back burner because I'm trying to make money. Yeah. A couple of things about that. Number one was on the top five regrets, which one is being, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That was reported by every male that she worked with in their life transition. Number two, Bronnie Ware, who's been on this podcast, um, she came up with that list as as as, as an as, as an after effect of um, wanting to write a blog, just wanting to start a blog, and she didn't really know what to write about, and so she thought about this experience that she had years and years ago, which was a side job while she was trying to be a musician. She was trying mm-hmm. to be a musician. This was her side gig, uh, working in palliative care. She had no experience in doing it, but she felt, you know, very maternal because she treated everyone like they were her grandmother, according to her. And she turned out to be very good at it, but she never thought in a million years, this is going to be my, my purpose, my passion. She was just showing up every day because she liked it. She liked doing it. She liked having these conversations with people. And so she went through this whole period of depression, suicidal ideation, many, many years later, now she's working at a jail teaching songwriting and she needs to make some money. So she's starting up this blog and she thinks to herself, she goes to a conference and they talk about different blog titles and, oh, you should do top five or top 10 or whatever lists, listicles. And she tries to force herself to think of something to write about. And you said before, you know, success comes when you do what's easy. And so mm-hmm. she kind of thought about, okay, well, let me just write about what I know, because that's the easiest thing to start with. And she mm-hmm. thought, well, I work with these palliative care patients, um, and they all express some regrets at the end. Maybe I'll write about that. Oh, yeah, top five regrets of the dying. And so that's how that came about. And now it's become, you know, an often quoted statistic when, when talking about the subject of, of death, which I think, which, which I want us to go into in a moment. But I want to finish talking about this idea of purpose as well. And the question I have for you is, does everybody have a purpose? And if so, how do they hold themselves accountable to that purpose? And I know that's probably going to lead to us talking about the journal as well, because that's that's one of the, the intentions behind it is to give you some degree of accountability. But just let's say the journal doesn't exist. Um, how people or how have you been talking about that and thinking about holding, holding yourself accountable to that purpose? Yeah. So the first question, you know, I, I think sometimes purpose is an overwhelming idea, you know, sort of like Mm -hmm. what's, what's the meaning of your life? (laughs) You know, like that's, that's a big uh, question to answer. So sometimes I, I, I feel as though we shouldn't, use our brain, we should use our, our gut or our heart and follow feelings versus our thoughts. Because, you know, my def, I, I, one of the ways I like to think about purpose is, is how it makes you feel. Does it make, do you feel joy? Do you feel a sense of fulfillment in, in doing something? And I think that you can have many different purposes based on the many different things that bring you that sense of joy. You know, one of my purposes is to is to be a, a good friend, you know? And, and what does that mean? That means uh, spending energy, investing in those relationships, showing up for my friends when they, I can tell that they need me um, because they've showed up for me in the past. And, I, and I've realized that when I'm in my darkest moments, there's nothing more important than 
someone that cares about me showing that they care about me and being there for me in that, in that moment. I just, I just realized that just is one of the most important things you can do in, in, in life. And so one of my things that I want to do is be a good friend. And so that, that, that gives me a sense of purpose and that, you know, that means that regardless of what I'm doing, I need to make sure that that is a priority. So if I'm doing something and it's important, but then my friend puts up an SOS and they're struggling and I can tell that they need me, then I make sure I drop whatever I'm doing to call them, you know, to show them that, that I'm there. So that's for me, a purpose. Another, you know, so there's, I think it, it can be many different things and it shouldn't be, uh, you know, there's another way I like to think about it is like, does it, does it excite you when you think about it? Mm -hmm. Um, I love the idea of connecting with new people. And, uh, I love, I love traveling. Like when I think about a trip that I have planned, I get excited, (laughs) you know, like I get butterflies thinking about these, these exciting trips that I have planned. And so that for me is something that, uh, is, is one of my purposes is to explore. Uh, there's also this feeling of, um, you know, what am I curious about? So following curiosity, I think that that can lead to, to purpose. So I think following feelings is a little less overwhelming as an idea than defining what your purpose is in life or, you know, what are you here to do? And I think that, as you said, you find that by following those roads, just like Bronnie Ware, she didn't sit down and say, my purpose is to figure out the top five regrets of the dying. Mm-hmm. Here we go. I'm going to go into palliative care. I'm going to start my research and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be the foremost, you know, authority <laughs> on this topic. No, she just started doing it because she liked to do it. And then she realized something that was exciting and interesting to her. So she followed that feeling mm-hmm. and then things started to unravel. And then, like I said, she was living true to herself. She things started to click. She followed that momentum. Tim Ferriss talks about this a lot. You know, when you, when you, when you approach a problem, ask yourself, what would it look like if it were easy? You know, mm-hmm. sometimes we think it's got to be so hard. So what's the, so you follow that momentum and you're, I think you're living on purpose. Um, now this leads us to the problem, which <laughs> is it's hard to continually keep this awareness of living on purpose you know, of following these things that are important to you. Because if you look at the research, that ends up being the biggest regret people have at the end of their life. So it's clearly, this is a problem, right? We, we regret the things we didn't do. The number one regret, this is from research out of Cornell, or there's a psychologist named Tom Gilovich, which is basically the whole journal is based off of this, this stat that I read where I was totally shook, which found people on their deathbed, they, 76% of people, they, their biggest regret was not living for them, living for what they thought others expected of them or what they thought others wanted for them. Right. So that's messed up. That, that means that three quarters of the population is living their whole life and they're reaching their deathbed and they're realizing when it's too late that they, that they blew it. So Mm -hmm. why does that happen? And this is when you start to look at, okay, what are the problems? Because um, there's really three big problems. And the first is that there's no deadlines with these personal goals. So that's why we push them. There's no deadlines for me being a good friend. Mm -hmm. Um, So I need to create accountability around that goal to drive me forward. And what that means is, I need a reminder to do it. I need other people keeping me accountable. And so just like when you train for a marathon with a partner, you're, you have a higher chance of going through with that marathon. That's an accountability buddy that, that continues to drive you forward. So there's small little things that you can do. When you write your bucket list, that creates accountability. It seems really small, but you take something that doesn't exist, you make it real. That's a reminder it exists. You talk about your goals. If I tell you I'm going to be a good friend to you, I'm more likely to be a good friend to you. Hmm. You know, if I say, listen, I'm going to be there for you. If you need me, I'm more likely to be there for you because I've told you that. And now I feel accountable to you. If I tell you next year, my, my, I'm going to write another book. I'm just going to just get another one out there. And, and I'm, that's my biggest goal. And then I run into you in LA and you say, Hey, how's the book coming? 
six months later. And I think, yeah, I better start writing that book. <laughs> so writing down your goals, sharing your goals, having an accountability buddy check in with you, or even better, you send regular updates to someone else, you're 77% more likely to achieve your goal. So, you know, if I would have said, I'm going to write a book, but I'm going to send you an update once a month, let you know how it's going. That really drives you forward. So that's what the bucket list journal is intended to do is to, is to be your accountability buddy, because you write your list, you start to choose your accountability buddy, you set rewards, you set deadlines, you break it down into manageable steps. So, you know, that's the first problem is there's no deadlines and we need to create accountability. So problem is no deadlines, solution, accountability. The second problem is we're usually waiting to feel inspired to tackle these personal projects. And the inspiration rarely hits us out of the blue. Or we're waiting for the perfect time. You know, we're just planning. We're like, as soon as I'm ready, I'm going to do it. It's got to be perfect. And we over plan. And then we forget that action is a plan. You don't need to have a plan. You just mm -hmm. need to take action. You'll figure out the plan as you go because you create your own inspiration through action. You're not going to feel inspired. You have to create that movement. It's pushing a snowball over a hill. It's got to have that first push to grow that inertia. So this is a really interesting idea because I think most people get stuck before they even begin, you know, they haven't even taken that first step. And that first step is the hardest because it leads you to the third problem, which is fear. And fear happens to be the number one barrier. And it's either the fear of what other people think, or it's the fear of failure. And so when we are waiting to take the first step, a lot of times it's because but if I do this, what are people going to think? What if they know that I, that I fail? You know, what if they think it's dumb? Uh, I don't want to share my goals because what if, what, what if they know that's what I want to do? But the irony is if you don't share your goals, no one can help you. You're completely on your own. So you just have a less chance of accomplishing it. And if you don't start, you don't learn. You don't create your own momentum. And if you unpack what those fears really are, uh, First of all, the fear of what other people think is something that I find difficult. And, and, and I don't think it really goes away. But what I've realized is that I think people are just thinking about me less than I think they are. <laughs> They're not sitting around thinking about me. They're worried about what other people are thinking about them. Or they're more, mm -hmm. they're also more, this is the big thing. They're more supportive. I don't know if you found this, but like when you share something, that you is really important to you authentically and, you know, passionately people tend to step up and, and help more than you, more than they're like, that's dumb. <laughs> you know, they, they, and that's what we found since day one, when we started buried life, we were surprised how people stepped up to help us with our list. And they, they, people came out of the woodwork. They would email us from all over the country, then all over the world. They want us to cross everything off our list. And it was crazy. And so, you know, I think that if we, if we ask for help, you know, sometimes people will step up. And so there's those three barriers and, and yeah, I, th I think that there's, there's an awareness there that needs to be, we need to just be aware of those, those things so that we can start to overcome those and not, and, and that, that I don't think if we're, if, we're, if we're not conscious of them, it's, it's obviously much more difficult to, to overcome them. Mm -hmm. So you have given how many talks now since you became like a professional full-time keynote speaker? Oh, good question. Like hundreds, right? Five, four or 500 maybe. Yeah. So you've talked to literally, I don't know, maybe even close to a million people at this point, both in person and virtually. Um, obviously you, have spoken about this a lot. So talk about the genesis of the bucket list journal. Why was that necessary? Was hearing you not enough? And, um, and how, how were you thinking about structuring this journal so that it's not just another journal that someone has on their bookshelf and they actually will uh, use it for its, its intended purpose? Mm -hmm. 
And I'm thinking specifically of people who may listen to you or may have heard about your story who say, you know what, I don't even know what my purpose is. I don't know if I have a purpose, yeah. um, you know, that kind of thing. Or, or even someone like you who was depressed and living as a hermit in your mom's house, like with the journal work with in that mm. state. Yeah. Yeah. So good question. So if I miss one, just uh, bring it up again. Um, mm-hmm. So the first piece, uh, why? And mm-hmm. um, the biggest reason was that uh, my friends don't come see me speak because they can't really, because the public can't unfortunately come to my talks because they're a lot of them are for companies for their teams or leadership or associations. And so I, sp- I, I, I found myself doing all my work in a, in a bit of a bubble where it was really meaningful and I loved it. Um, most people didn't know what I did. <laughs> and also most of the things that I was talking about were not available to anyone that couldn't come to my keynote. So I thought that's not ideal. So I, I, I want a, a product that has these ideas in them so that someone that doesn't see the keynote can take the same action and steps and hopefully get the same inspiration from the, the actual keynotes themselves. I also wanted something for people in the room to take action and a tool that they could use afterwards and take all these ideas and inspiration and actually act on them. And then, and then putting together, and basically the, because the big idea is because my, I think my purpose is changing that percentage of bringing that 76% of people that die regretting the things they didn't do down <laughs> so that more people are in the minority, even if they don't achieve those goals, but they've tried. And so next up was like, okay, what does this look like? And I didn't, the reason it took so long is because there was no journal out there that I felt I could use as a model because I just, I didn't want it to be the same page repeated and repeated. And I also wanted to, it to tell my story so that people understood who I was. So they understood why I was doing this, but also they understood the, the purpose of it and the barriers. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted a framework that people could use. So it's easier to write your list because I think that when you sit down with a piece of paper, it's a little overwhelming just to think about like, okay, what are all the things I want to do in my life? <laughs> and and typically you think right away, when you think about a bucket list, you think adventure and travel. At least I did. I was mm-hmm. like, you know, the usual suspects, skydive, bungee jump, travel to Europe. And so I started to realize that if this is going to be a reflection of my true self, I better reflect all categories of my life. And so, you know, I kind of did some research and realized there are about 10 categories of life that you want your list to reflect. And so the first step is breaking down your list. So you write your list in those 10 categories. So you write your adventure travel goals, but you also write your physical health goals, mental health goals, anything that's going to relieve stress. Do you know, any, do you know anything about that? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about stress. <laughs> uh, your material goals. Like it's, it's okay to have things that you just want to make you happy, right? Sailboat, new tennis racket, car, you know, mm-hmm. creative goals, which I think is an often overlooked pillar of wellness. When you're creative, you're, you know, talk about, I love this theme of obviously being your true self. When you're creative, you're expressing this, this real version of yourself. You're, you're, you're drawing, you're, you're playing music. You're in this, you, that's the flow state that you get in when you do something creative. So I think it's important to so remember that financial goals, right? Intellectual goals. What do you want to learn? Uh, professional goals. And then giving goals, relationships. That's a big one, right? We talked about being a good friend. One of the mm-hmm. top five regrets of the dying, as you know, is I wish I would have stayed in contact with friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also, I wish I would have expressed how I really felt, you know, something along mm-hmm. those lines. Again, mm-hmm. all these things don't cost any money, but we should identify what those mean to us so that we don't have any of those regrets. So thinking about the format of this was like, okay, how do I piece all this together so that it makes sense? And I just sort of thought like, what, what, what do I do? Well, you know, let's first, let's break down the list of these 10 categories. So it's a little more digestible to write, you know, and there's like prompts of like, here are some ideas. Here's my favorite list item in this category. And then it's starting to just 
identify what those barriers are. So you describe those things that I described, no deadlines, mm -hmm. waiting for inspiration and the fear. And so hopefully then these exercises that you do next start to make sure that you can move through those barriers. So the whole journal is designed to get you over those three barriers. So then you start to break down your goals, as I said, and build that accountability, um, identify the real fear and the imagined fear. And it was important that it was uh, kind of a nice book. I mean, I think it's kind of, you know, beautiful, but I, you, I, I think it's important that you write your list in a place that you keep and you kind of cherish because you only need one. This is your, mm -hmm. this, this will grow as you grow. So you continue to, to want to come back to it. So it's great to have it as a piece of paper, but eventually the piece of paper will might get lost, gets ripped, you know, but if you have a nice, nice book, then you're going to continue to hopefully use it and, and update it. And as you grow, your list grows. And so there's also like free journaling space at the back. There's some quotes that I think get you thinking about different things. And um, so that was the, that was the process. And so for each item, you have people um, state why the goal is important to them. You have them list a reward that they will give themselves once they achieve the goal. You have them state the date that they will achieve it by. Mm -hmm. um, you have them list out a few small steps they can take to move forward. Um, and then any obstacles that they foresee getting in the way. So have, do you have any case studies of people who, who've actually implemented this and, and someone who's achieved a goal that you thought was pretty cool? Yeah, th there's actually a cool story of a guy who uh, he just sent me an email and he listed off all these. He's like, oh, since I saw you last, I got my pilot's license. I went through the Grand Canyon. I camped in the Colorado Rockies. I, he's a CEO of a company, you know, and he's, mm -hmm. he's I just I'm on Saturday. I'm taking my parents to their dream vacation in um, in the Caribbean. They've always wanted to go. He said, and I've I've. I've looked for ways to, to help other people, small mm. ways. I picked someone up on the side of the road when their car was broken down. I volunteered for the local legion. Um, and so he was, he's, I think that was the coolest part was just the, that intentionality of wanting to help uh, other people. So giving is one of the categories of, of life. And so I, again, we get swept up. And so anything we can do to sort of live more intentionally to who we are and what we want is, is a win. Mm -hmm. And the, I read a statistic saying that you're 42% more likely to achieve a goal if you write it down. Was that part of the thinking behind the journal as well? Getting people to actually put yeah. it on paper? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's and, and and there's uh, uh look so if, if you just sort of step back and you think about it you feel you may feel like okay is this is writing down your goals you're actually going to do anything you're not actually um taking a step towards what what that thing is mm. but let's just like take a step back okay so you you, you stop you, you you write down your goal well first of all you stop and that's the one of the most important things you force yourself to reflect. So in a world where 76% of the population, their biggest regret is not living for them. <laughs> it's sure important that we take time to reflect and make sure we are on our true course. So just that as a, as a reason to write your list is probably enough. And then you, you, you're, you articulate in some way, you're, you're, you're moving it forward by taking an idea that doesn't exist. And now it's on paper. So you, as you get buried by the day-to-day, -day, you come back to your list and, and it's pointing you in the direction that you know you want to go because you've taken the time to think about what's important. So you've kind of memorialized it on a piece of paper. Now it's your compass pointing you in that, that true north. It's not going to make you achieve the goal, but any way that you can create accountability, and I think it's different for everyone. Uh, and I think it's important to figure out what works for you. Some people, it might be putting it in your calendar, mm -hmm. right? Some people, it might be an accountability buddy 
If you think about it though, accountability works. That's pretty much all we have driving us forward in the professional space in, at, at our jobs, right? Leaders, their job is to keep us accountable. Salary keeps us accountable. We don't want to let down our teams. That keeps us accountable. We don't want to look bad. That keeps us accountable. We can create those same structures around our personal goals. And I think that's the big goal. Yeah, famously, you and the Buried Life crew wrote as one of your initial goals before you had any production deals, you know, people were living each other's in people's basements and whatnot. You wrote as a goal, we're going to play basketball with President Obama at the White House. And it was a little bit up and down, didn't look like it was going to happen. And then it eventually happened. And it's a great story. So when people are are filling out their goals in the bucket list journal, how should they think about the probability of achieving goals? Because I've also heard you say you should go for impossible goals because everybody's going for the easy stuff. So t- talk about that a little bit. I like the idea of the fact that most people uh, inherently don't believe that they can do great things. This is actually also, I believe, uh, from Tim Ferriss, which is that people are shooting for realistic goals, which means level of competition is highest for realistic goals. So if you shoot for unrealistic goals, there's less competition. (laughs) Um, But I think that it's important to also note that a big goal isn't better than a small goal. You know, I like to encourage people to go after big dreams if it's true to them. If that's something Mm. they really want to do, not just for the sake of doing a big goal because it's a monster goal, but if you have a big dream hidden, buried inside you, I think it's important that you unearth that and see where that goes. Um, And the litmus test for that to know if something is true to me or not is the fact that I've been thinking about it for a long time or when I do think about it, it makes me feel expansive or what's your thinking on that? I like using my deathbed. I like using my, my, my future self. So okay. I, I, I ask my future self, I picture myself on my deathbed and I, and I ask myself, would, will I regret not doing this? Hmm. And if the answer is yes, then I think that it's a, it's a fairly good indication that you should try. I do like the idea of talking to your 90 year old self as much as possible because it's not as far off as you think. Right. We think we have all this time, but you hear from a lot of folks that are older, how, how quickly life seems to go. And you can experience in your own life, how much life seems to move faster and faster as you get older. And um, I think that for me personally, you know, I, I just don't, I don't internalize the fact that I'm going to die enough. And I, I try to do that more. You know, I, I have a, an app on my phone that reminds me I'm going to die five times a day <laughs> with a quote, which I thought was a bit, uh, it, it actually wasn't going to be effective, but it kind of is, it kind of works. Uh, it's called We Croak. It's sort of <laughs> elementary, but it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a cool idea. But I mean, you hear this a lot. I had, cancer and, and, and everything changed, or I lost my, my father or my, my partner. And after that, my whole perspective shifted. So why, why does it take a trauma that is so crippling to shake us into perspective? Can we have that same shift and what can we wake up without having to go through that experience? And so I think the, one of the only ways to do that is to really keep death close to you. And that's why we asked ourselves the question, what do you want to do before you die? That, that was the center of the whole project. The, buried, the, the bucket list came from that question, right? When we asked mm-hmm. ourselves that question and really said, sat with it and said, okay, we're going to die. The only thing we can count on in this life is that we're going to die. So if that's the only constant, what do we want to do 
in our life. And so that was the, the answer to that question was, was the bucket list. So, you know, I, I think that that is the big goal is to figure out how can you keep that perspective because it's very easy to get swept up by life and forget about that. Um, and if you look at a, 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 an image of the weeks that we have in our life, you know, you can, you can see it in a, um, I, 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 it's this little block of squares and you think there's no way that's the number of by, by uh, the guy who does, uh, what is it called? The why, um, I the can't, blog. I've seen um, it a couple different places. Tim, Tim, something or another. He does yeah. something about why anyway. Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's shocking. And he talks about, he talks about how, when you really break it down, you know, to the average 30,000 days that a uh, human lives, and you're in your forties, right? You, you have like 20 more summers or you have like, t- you know, 30 more times. You're probably going to see your parents. If you only see them once or twice a yeah. year and, and it gives you real perspective, but to extrapolate this idea of death, can you talk about, I know you're not the authority on this, but what's your personal view on what happens after you die? Hmm. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> My personal, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, but what's your feeling? Like if you could, if you could had a magic wand, what would you like to, I don't think you go away. Mm-hmm. I think that your, your spirit lives on, you know, your essence lives on. I, I don't know what it looks like, but I think that, um, I think that there's that, that spirit continues, um, but I, I don't know if you're going to come back and have another go at it, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, I think that that would be a pleasant surprise for me. And so I'm going to continue to just act like this is, there's, there's no dress rehearsal and this is, this is the one that I have. And, uh, and I think that I would, I would always like, when I was younger, I would, I remember, one of my first existential crises was I was like, I don't know, maybe nine or seven or something. And I just remember sitting by myself and thinking that you died forever and that you were, and that lasted forever. And I, I couldn't get my mind around that idea that you were just, that was forever was forever. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I yeah, I don't, I don't know if like that was the first time I started thinking about about death, but um, I just find it interesting that uh, when I see someone in their 90s and they're they're walking down the street and they're shuffling along and, you know, maybe they're hunched over with a cane and, you mm-hmm. know, moving very slowly. And I don't think that will be me. Mm-hmm. Not for a second. And that is the only thing I can count on if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll live to, you know, 90, <laughs> I can walk out tomorrow and be gone. But like, that's interesting that that's not what you think when you see that, because it's the only thing you can count on, you know, unless like someone like Elon has us living forever <laughs> you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it's, uh, I, I feel like it, that, that if we knew, if we really in, internalize that and you, and you looked at those number of weeks you have left and you look at the summers you have left and you look at the number of times you get to see your parents, you know, before they get too old. Um, and you could remind yourself of that. I don't have the best answer, but that would be, uh, the goal because the thing about death is it cuts through all the BS you know, it just, it right. just like, I like to try and think about if I'm upset about something, I like, I like to think about, am I even going to remember this in five years, let alone on my deathbed and, and nine times out of 10, not only am I not going to be pissed about it, I won't even remember it, you know? And so that helps put things in perspective, but it's uh it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's super hard. Yeah. That, um, that blog I was thinking of was wait, but why? And the guy's name is Tim urban. He's the one that designed a little death graphic. 
<laughs> so you're the bucket list guy, right? You, you've <laughs> checked more things off of your list than probably, you know, 10 people could check off in an entire lifetime. What is there left for you? Or is your biggest item on that list to facilitate other people's bucket list experience? Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I mean, I think that you're, you're onto something. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I think that my, sure, there's, there's still a lot of things that I want to do. Like and, what? And um, I'd like to do something in space. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to finish the film, the Buried Life documentary mm -hmm. that we've been filming since day one. And uh, well, you said as soon as you guys get to space, that's going to be the perfect close yeah, to the film, right? I think so. Yeah. And so we are, I'm actually a bit, made a bit of progress talking with Worldview, who's sending these pods up to space, the edge of space. Mm -hmm. And they're going to send one, ones up in 2024. And I spoke, I did, I, I moderated a panel at South by about the democratization of space travel because there are a lot of companies coming out and they are bringing the price down. So not just billionaires can go to space. And the reason why I want to do it for the most part is that I'd like to experience the overview effect, which is this experience astronauts have when they're in space and they're looking down on earth and you feel this sense of oneness with the earth and this affinity to humanity, which mm -hmm. would be pretty ex extraordinary. So I'd love to, I think that would create a cool ripple effect. Um, so, and as well, I think the documentary would create a very um, meaningful ripple effect so that people could see the story and, uh, you know, hopefully like the endless summer type of film where you could watch it and just get that feeling of that, uh, that jolt of, of, of energy and inspiration that, that we felt on that, you know, those first road trips where we're just like magic happened, you know, talk about things happening serendipitously. That's all the buried life was, right. It was just, people would just show up and help us do all these things. And it all just was this, you know, road where of course we had to work and there was a lot of bumps in the road, but like we knew that there was something special um, and that's what kept us going. So yeah, space and, and film. And, and then ultimately uh, as you said, figuring out uh, cool ways to share this message and idea. And I think too, like trigger people, hopefully in a way similar to a near death experience or the death of a loved one to sort of get that jolt of like, okay, it's, it's never too late. Cause the truth is a year from now, you're going to wish you had started today, but you mm -hmm. feel like it's too late. We'll cut to 12 months from now. You're going to look back and be like, damn it. I wish I would have started. It's never a good time to start. Yeah, I, I heard a podcast with, uh, you know, Stephen Pressfield, the guy who, who wrote The War of Art. Mm -hmm. He was talking to someone um, who had started this, or maybe he was relating this anecdote, but some guy started this, this nonprofit that was going to give late stage cancer patients an outlet to do what they've always dreamt of doing. And so, you know, one lady wanted to paint. So he got her enrolled in some painting classes. Somebody else wanted to learn how to ride a horse. Somebody else um, wanted to start to become a florist or something like that. And what they found, what they found unsurprisingly was that when these people started fulfilling their, their goals, their bucket list items, a lot of the times their cancer went into remission <laughs> and they ended up living a lot, long, a lot longer. So you know, what you're talking about is, is one of the pillars of healthcare. Cause especially nowadays, man, with like holistic medicine, you know, people say, Oh, I can't sleep at night. First thing they want to do is give you some magnesium and this and that, but nobody really asks, are you, are you doing what makes you happy? Are you, are you fulfilling man, your dream? You're, I think you nailed it. So what's, so I'm reading uh, man's search for meaning Victor Frankl's book. Um, mm -hmm. First time, second second time, yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> but it was a while ago. The first time, and but but what you said, so that's kind of similar, right? When he's talking about the people that made it through 
the concentration camps, they had uh, a purpose. They had a why, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and once they, once they lost that, they died. Um, and he was the doctor there at the camps. Mm -hmm. And, and so what you said reflects that as well, living with, with purpose. Um, because you have that, like, why am I here? And I think that there's another conversation, which is kind of interesting around the, the way that we look at seniors and we feel, and there's this narrative that they're just, you know, they're, they're over the hill. I, I, I think that the senior population, and I've spoken to a lot of senior communities. And I think this, that we always say the youth are going to change the world. I also, I think the seniors can change the world because they have the experience. They have the time, they have the wisdom, the, the disposable income, they have the connections. And so if we're able to enable these folks to, um, to anybody, but to, these, to, to, to find that purpose, because uh, once you get to the, and you retire, that's your purpose is your job for the most, a lot of people, right? And once you lose that, it's sort of like you fish out of water. Uh, I, so I think purpose is incredibly important for longevity and well-being, and, and when I talk about a resilience toolkit or my my mental health toolkit, which are, you know, what we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, which are the habits to that work for me to increase, allow me to get through stress, um, you know, and purpose is one of those things because right. I think I think it's super important. And there's if if, if you want to, I do have that as a as a download on my Instagram if you want to look at the the mental health toolkit. So let's let's kind of um, wrap up the conversation talking about I think one of the stickiest topics when whenever somebody's inspired to to take on something like this a bucket list or a buried life initiative or get the journal what have you but they're in a relationship and yeah. their partner's not really bought into it so mm -hmm. that that creates some friction how how does one navigate a situation like that. Well, great question. That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, look, there, I think there's, there's a couple different ways to approach it. I think first and foremost is communicating to that person what is truly important to you so mm -hmm. that they know and they can understand why this is important to you and hopefully then support you to, to do that thing. Um, I, I think that then, you know, it, it's, it's a question of, is this person supporting you to be that true version of yourself, the, the person that you know that you want to be. And that is a longer conversation. And I think it's a very, uh, sometimes you're with someone that, that, it, that enables you to be that person. And sometimes you are, and then it, gets to the point where you feel like you're not. And so I think it's important to talk about that at that point. Um, because one of the biggest things that I learned very early on, completely by accident, was the importance of surrounding yourself with people that inspire you and that give you energy. And the buried life began out of that choice because I intentionally called up a friend named Johnny, who is a filmmaker, and asked him if he wanted to make a movie because I wanted to be around people that inspired me. And I thought that his videos that he was making was super inspiring. And ultimately that led me down the path that I am today. And I continue to do that, whether it's friends or with, with partners. So I, you know, I think that it's important that you try and be aware of how people are making you feel. And if they're not giving you energy or they're not inspiring you, that's completely okay, but I do think it's important that you start a conversation and figure out, okay, what's going on here? You know, why am I not feeling like I can be who I am? You know, why do I feel like I'm being held back in this relationship? And ideally, you're with someone that makes you more who you are versus less of who you are. And I think we've all been in relationships that make us feel less of who we are. And that's a hard place to be. And it's also a difficult thing to decipher. Why is, am I not feeling like 
myself? You know, why do I feel contained or why do I feel like, and so uh, sometimes that's communication. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that you talk about it. Or if you're able to talk with a couples therapist, I think that's incredibly helpful because sometimes you just need that perspective, that third party, that perspective, because you're living in your bubble, your partner's living in their bubble and there's a lot of misses. (laughs) So if you have someone there as a grounding source of uh, fact, (laughs) I think that's, 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 that's been helpful for me because you have that stable um, sounding board. And so I think the biggest thing is to talk about it if you're having that feeling. And I do think it's also really important to figure out what is your list together? What are the, what are your goals as a couple, as a family? You know, I hear amazing stories of people starting summer family bucket lists, of starting couples bucket lists. You know, this is a, this is an important conversation to have because you're unearthing the most important things to you and your partner. So let's talk about it and let's figure out, let's get aligned on those things. And if we don't want to do the same thing, that's okay. But know that this is important to me and I want to move towards this thing. And I'm going to support you to do the things that make you who you are and support you to be that person. And like, for instance, if something it's like introvert versus extrovert, as an extrovert, I get energy from being out with friends and dinners and social things. If my partner is not, then it's like, we understand that and I can go and I can go out and it's okay that she stays home and does the things that fill her up, which may be more introverted, but it starts with a, with a conversation. Beautiful. Um, Final question here. You made a choice to self publish this book, which is a little bit interesting because you're a best-selling author And obviously, it wouldn't be that difficult to get relationships with publishers. You're speaking to tens of thousands of people. So talk about the thinking behind that in case somebody else is listening to this and and they may be inclined to want to publish a book, self-publish or or publish through a publisher. So I decided to self-publish, one, because of the quality that I knew now I could create a book that was as high quality as it would be with a publisher, which I think hasn't necessarily been the case for years past. And I also realized that I was going to be the sole source of distribution through my speaking engagements, selling to you know anyone that wanted to buy it online. I didn't really care about brick and mortar as much, selling it in bookstores. I knew that I could figure out how to sell it on Amazon myself. And um, I could figure out how to make it on my own, although it was a much bigger lift than I thought, as I've talked with you about Uh, manufacturing something uh, overseas, the shipping, uh, distribution, you know, all those things were completely new to me. And it was a it was a beast, but I had full and still have full control and. I'm super proud of the way that it turned out. And I think that the, the quality is, is the same as it would be through a publisher. And now I, I know all about logistics. <laughs> no, I know all about manufacturing. Now, anyway, I, you know, I created a product from beginning to end, which I think is a, is a, is a, is a, is a compliment for me because it's my first one that I've done on my own. And so I like the, the fact that I am, in control of, of, of it from beginning to, to end. And, uh, and it was definitely something that I wanted to do on my own. Well, you also have said that now that you've done the whole bucket list thing for a while, you never see things as impossible anymore. So you, you're very careful about saying what you want to do and what you don't want to do, because you know, you can do it if you put in the work, the tension and, and, and the focus. Um, where can people get the book or how, how do you recommend people get the book? Probably the easiest is on Amazon. If you search bucket list journal, it'll pop right up. There's um, only one bucket list journal. There's only one now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it had a good release. So it hit number one on Amazon and now it's just number one when you search bucket list journal. Um, and you can also get it through bucketlistjournal.co, which is the website. Um, those are the best two places. And, uh, but I recommend, um, 
especially if you're outside of the U S than, than Amazon, because I think it's better shipping uh, mm -hmm. and, and logistics and that type of thing. So that's the, that's the best place. Let me know how it goes. I, I love to see like people's um, their lists and, and their stories of, of what they go after. So it's uh, it's fun for me to, to get those updates. Is there any, um, do you have any trending hashtags that we can look up to see what people are doing for their bucket list or anything like that yet? Not yet, but let's start bucket list journal as a hashtag. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get, I better get on that right now. <laughs> Awesome. And, and last, okay. La final, final question. Yeah. How are you thinking about success these days? Now that you've come out with this journal. Success is sleeping through the night. <laughs> mm. I, I like, I like, so I have trouble sleeping sometimes. Well, I, I told you I had trouble sleeping. I have trouble mm. sleeping when I'm stressed out. If I'm sleeping through the night, I'm not stressed out. That means it's a, it's a, it's a win. You know, I, I like that as a measure of success. Um, and, and, and my other measures of success come down to uh, feeling like my life is in that state of, of flow and, mm. and that fulfillment. And, you know, and that includes taking time for me, taking time to invest in my friends do the things that are important to me. And, uh, and so those are the big things for, for me right now, you know, giving back in the way that I like to give back, which is, uh, you know, speaking and, and firing people up around this idea and, um, and, and make sure I take a bit of time for me, which has been tricky lately, but that's, you know, everyone's a work in progress. <laughs> Beautiful, man. Well, thank you so much for coming back onto the podcast, for uh, sharing so vulnerably and openly and for showing up and for providing this wonderful offering to the world, Bucket List Journal. It's, it's, uh, it's an exciting thing. I, I have one. It's beautiful. And, um, and I, as I said to you when you first gave it to me and I got a chance to really look at it, I said, this can, this can really change lives. This is a very, very powerful, probably one of the most powerful books that I've ever possessed because it's all meant to be filled with one's own desires. And, um, and once you write them down, I know for myself, once I write them down, I, I'm committed. So it's powerful stuff. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. That means a lot. Thank you. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.